transitioning towards a green economy at the same time, aiming to, inf uh, to integrate more closely into the European and Atlantic area. Today's session aims to explore this journey, the journey that Ukraine is making in sustainable development in an Eastern European country. And we have two parts to our session today. The first is a 25 minute session with the uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Then we will shuffle some chairs around and bring down a panel of speakers to talk about the implement implementation of policy on the journey to the green transition. So beginning with the opening session, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Olga Stefan Ishnia, approximately, <laughs> who is Deputy Prime Minister. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration, an international law graduate from Kiev, formerly Director General of the Government Office for Coordination of European and Euro-Atlantic Integration in the Ukrainian Cabinet. Over to you to speak for eight minutes or so. Thank you so much. It's working. It, it's coming through the headphones. Is that working? People are saying it's coming through the headphones. It's working. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't think that really I need even like eight minutes because we will still have a session of questions and un answers. And I think that it would be much more fascinating than just delivering a speech, uh, especially ahead of the upcoming uh, statement from Ukraine, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who will be the, the agenda setter basically today for the uh, input and uh, input of Ukraine into the general climate change processes and the, um, uh, the input that could be brought from Ukraine from Ukrainian perspective. I think that um, it is really important to begin from understanding that Ukraine uh, is one of the biggest markets outside of EU in the European continent, uh, basically uh, setting the trends for the transformation of the whole region, which is outside of EU, including those neighboring countries. So, and uh, this is this is the reality we're in. And basically, Ukraine has one of the largest uh, trade agreements with the European Union since uh, since the history of the association agreements itself. So, uh, and basically, five years after this agreement has been signed, we have uh, significantly. Uh, advanced in regulatory approximation. So uh, the position of Ukraine is following. So we have no other way than to move further with approximation of the market rules to the European. But at this stage, it is really important for us that we could not only deconsume the policies, but also to form them. And this is basically a vital issue for us. And uh, uh, given uh, having said that, um, I mean that uh, when it comes to the green transition, uh, Ukraine has chosen from the very beginning the way of aligning the policies and participating in a policy process. That's why Ukraine has been one of the uh, key countries who has launched the dialogue with the European Union on the policy process, uh, including the implementation of the European Green Deal. These dialogues are only existing with the US, Japan, China, and Ukraine. So it shows that the attention to Ukrainian market is strong. The voice of Ukraine is heard, but this is like part of the positive story. Now the complicated story is following that we have um, agreed within the government that Ukrainian second nationally determined contribution on the Paris Agreement should be ambitious because Again, the logic that we want to be a policy setters, but not the policy consumers. And if we're not ambitious, we're, we're outside of the, of the box of those setting the agenda. Uh, and we spent almost a year in a very complicated and heavy discussions with Ukrainian industries and businesses who have to transform and form their next 10 year strategies for their development. And uh, I think that the, NDC we have adopted is, is a balanced political decision, which allows us to be here on the agenda. And it is already seen by the level of participation of Ukraine in the COP26. Ukrainian president is delivering remarks on the first day 
Uh, Ukraine has been invited by uh, basically most of the key stakeholders, top 10 countries, to join the initiatives like methane, like those related to forests, and uh, those related to f financial coordination, which has been, which wouldn't be impossible if Ukraine wouldn't be treated as a player. But then uh, the other part is that we have uh, been very pragmatic in setting ambitions goal. Why? Because uh, we made it conditional. And this would be part of the policy and the line we will be taking ahead of this COP26 is that we should cooperate uh, in transfer of technologies in coordination of access to financial resources and uh, uh, coordinate in the policy processes. So, uh, and the NDC we've adopted is conditional because we have uh, reached, we can reach this ambition only if Ukraine will be aligned with the European electricity market and will synchronize with ENSOE in 2023. If Ukrainian gas market will be sustainable and the gas market rules will be applicable to all players in a unified manner, which would serve as an instrument of predictability of our regulator, regulatory framework. Uh, then uh, we know that this ambition is only reachable if we would have access to not less than 10 billions of euros annually for the investments both in private and state sector. And uh, as well as uh, uh, we of course know that given that the vision is Ukraine 2030, we hope that by that time we will have deoccupied territories and Crimea brought back to Ukrainian territory. So, and this would be the best possible reason for reconsideration of our ambition, and hopefully this will take place. So, uh, so the purpose of our delegation being here today is to advocate for these conditions and call for the cooperation and collaboration with the state partners, uh, given the globality of uh, challenge. And I think it's really important that on the sidelines of this COP26, everybody are talking about the access to financial resources. It is It really matters because these are the global initiatives. We see that many countries are going through a very protectionist, uh, protectionistic policies, trying to preserve the particular moment to grab some part of economy. Uh, but all of us understand that we should look a bit more advanced. And if every country would start playing its own game, we will not reach the common goal. So now when we have the framework Paris Agreement, when we have the ambitions NDCs, uh, when we have the top 10 countries of the world has prioritized the climate policy in their governments, uh, it is really time to think globally how can we get really united over specific issues. Is the general coordination of financial framework the platform for the transfer of technologies so that every country could share the technologies they are advancing in uh, in, uh, uh, in decarbonization, uh, but also um, thinking about other areas which is not really being covered, not only the heavy industries, but for example, food production and localization of food productions and consumption. I think it's really, really important and we will pay our attention hopefully ahead of these two weeks um, to this uh, issue because Ukraine is the agrarian country. And uh, if there's something we know better than uh, than all the rest is something how to make how to make deal in that area. So um, uh, we're pretty positive in being here as as a player and the, as a contributor, uh, as ambitious country, being supported by Ukrainian business uh, as as a very pragmatic business, understanding that there's no other reality but to transform, but based on national interest, based on national context. And this is basically the logic we're putting into that. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for uh, wonderful opening remarks. Now we're just going to have a bit of a question and answer session. And um, let's start, start off with, with the NDC. So, you, you mentioned the reasons for the urgency of, of, of uh, and the ambition behind the NDC. What really are the main goals and how does the plans vary between uh, industry and energy generation and agriculture? You mentioned all of those. So, so what are the meat, what, what's the meat of the NDC and where are the constraints in making it even more ambitious versus where you are at the moment? 
Well, to be frank, uh, based on the calculations, and here we have the colleagues who have uh, been calculating the NDC, unfortunately, uh, given the Ukrainian context, this NDC is not very ambitious. Why? Because our industries has not been well developed. And the uh, level of decarbonization we've reached by that time is not because uh, we have been so green and so proactive in terms of decarbonization. It's because of the, uh, of the lack of vision and lack of investment into the in industrial development and, 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 and transition of the economy and development of the economy of the country itself. So, uh, so this is, was the initial point though, that uh, we have a starting point and we should preserve these dynamics, having in mind that uh, we are very ambitious in terms of our market development, growing economy and etc. So it, uh, it is an investment in the next 10 years to preserve the dynamic the same, but based on the positive development of, of economy. So, uh, so uh, that's why we're, we have put in uh, all the sectors covered, uh, covered by NDC into this, into this document, the agricultural policy policy, the industrial policy, uh, different uh, issues related to raw materials and etc. and transformation uh, and investment into the al alternative uh, sources of energy, which is uh, the core part of our national economic strategy until 2030, whereas the, uh, it is provided that not less than 25% of all energy will be consumed through alternatives. So uh, this is the ambitions we're here. Uh, based on the NDC we've submitted to Paris Agreement, we've already started to develop a concrete plan of decarbonization in each and every sector of the economy. It will be a multi-stakeholder dialogue because, uh, uh, because this is the only uh, instrument which brings credibility into the position of the government and which uh, brings business economy and the government decisions together to make sure that they're really implemented. Uh, we hope that by the end of this year, we will have the vision on, on um, uh, on each and every sector. It's been presented, but the major goal here today is to mobilize the platform for the coordination of financial resources. Because basically it's just been announced that EU and US has announced, uh, let's say, uh, 100 billions of uh, investments into the decarbonization, but it is not a very big sum. We know the resources from which this resource, this sum will be mobilized. And still we do not have clarity how can Ukraine or countries like Ukraine access these resources in the timelines we have set out for ourselves, for those industries we have prioritized and for those measures we see necessary. So um, as I'm leading the bilateral dialogue with the European Union, last time we met, we've agreed to establish the financial platform between European Union, Ukraine and IFIs to coordinate our efforts to make sure that NDC is implemented and the necessary resources are allocated for that. So this would be the principal element of the discussions that we will hear, hear, have here today. Uh, and based on that, we will then form the sectoral policies related to implementation of NDC based on the access to the resources we will have. And are you cautiously optimistic? Yes, I'm optimistic <laughs> because there are money. And basically, there is a natural problem in Ukraine that we have money, but we do not have the history or let's say capacity to utilize that and basically this is part of my mandate to make sure it happens so i'm rather um, i'm rather positive uh, and especially positive knowing that this is the condition for implementation of ndc which we have, which we have said there and our principal international partners have already agreed to do it thank you very much so so moving away from mitigation and the ndcs into the realm of adaptation um now Obviously, the, the way that the climate is changing can impose direct hazards on Ukraine, so an agricultural drought, extreme heat, but it can also impose uh, hazards through interrupting supply chains or whatever that cascade across borders, and we've certainly seen, seen this in, in the European um, context of, of, of us leaving Brexit and supply chain disruptions and, and so on. As you're looking ahead and thinking about building a society and an economy that is resilient, what sorts of steps are you thinking of and, and, and how are you actually going to manage that? 
this is one of the issues we are putting our utmost attention into because uh, uh, we understand that the um, uh, these steps I've been mentioning uh, taken individually by countries could really affect severely the the global structure of the economy and especially the the structure of the market within European Union mostly in the um, in a direction of its destabilization and for Ukraine it is like twice as more severe because we still uh, only in the process of building this chains and building this access to 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 a, a European or any other market so uh, and uh, uh, we are putting our a couple of goals in front of us to preserve the positive dynamic in terms of access for agricultural products uh, and, um, uh, and food products to a European market. And this has been a positive story for both of us. But also we want to launch um, a more global discussion in uh, investing into the sustainability of this, uh, of this production by launching, again, initiatives uh, related to uh, increasing more consumption of the local products, uh, preserving the chains. And I think that following the, the framework convention, we should think about the sectoral conventions and sectoral international agreements, which would put the framework for different sectors and for how do we see the, the market in specific sectors developed in the continent, in the worldwide? This is the new agreement we need, and this is what we will be advocating here in COP, about for Ukraine uh, in our bilateral dialogue with European Union, but also with US partners, but mostly also even in WTO and the largest presence here also uh, isn't short. We will, uh, we will advocate for the necessity to set the unified rules for all players to avoid any conflict or controversy in breaking through the, through the chains. We have some ideas. I will not spoil because some of them would probably be announced today ahead of the much higher presence than, uh, than only mine. So, but we uh, are putting the, the basis for this discussion for the next COP uh, uh, next year, and hopefully we will have uh, the initiative which will launch and boost the global um, efforts in that regard. Thank you very much. Um, so in the last two or three minutes, my final question is around your relationship with the EU. How can the EU's Green Deal facilitate your transition, your green transition? And what are your expectations from European partners? So you've talked a little bit about the financial side, but beyond that in... Well, uh, I think um, uh, the, the important element of that is that uh, it depends on Ukraine itself, whether European Green Deal will facilitate green transition or uh, make it much tougher or even impossible. Uh, and uh, my personal task is to ensure that we have the proper capacity to make sure that European Green Deal is really facilitating this process, which means that uh, we should get integrated into the policy planning processes. We should lobby for our interests in different structures. Uh, we should uh, have the positions on each and every initiatives which has been launched by, by European Green Deal. And uh, uh, we should be very much integrated into the internal elements of this process, as well as the at the highest political level, at the, have, uh, the level of the heads of states discussion. Uh, and this requires a proper capacity from Ukrainian side. Uh, otherwise, we will then consume the policies, as I was saying. We will then uh, mitigate the effects or negative even effects of these policies, like uh, as if it could have been with the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Whereas uh, in the beginning of this policy process, Ukraine had, Ukraine had no word to say. Yeah. And we basically heard the answer that uh, you will simply have the tax and there's nothing you can do without that. But we have treated ourselves as partners. We use the association agreement. We launched the consultations. We preserved our arguments. We mobilized other international partners outside of the EU. And today we see that there is no... Um, radical position as regards Ukraine, because we are treated as the partner, as the FTA partner, as the energy community partner, and that really matters to us. But we really should expand this positive experience to all areas. And that really depends on us, how effective our business in, is, an, is in advocating, how effective our government is in hearing the business, balancing the policies and preserving uh, its national interests, but also in how effective our advocation is. Otherwise, if it is not so, 
uh, we understand that European Green Deal, the green transition is not the one day policy. It's not something related to political cycle, which would then change overnight with the new commission. This is the new reality the whole world is advancing in, and we should really stay at the same level. So, um, so my answer is that uh, it depends on us. And you're, you're talking about us in terms of the political you're talking about us in terms of the industry, but what about, what about us in terms of the citizenry, the, the, the people? Are they fully behind what you would, where you, are they where you would like them to be to give you the political mandate to drive this further and faster? Uh, well, generally, we made a number of surveys um, related to general policy, uh, general prioritization of the environmental policy, and it is very much positively percepted by Ukrainian citizens and population, but still we have to a lot, invest a lot into the culture of uh, individual input of every citizen into this environmental policy. We're doing a lot uh, in uh, consultations with the business, with the stakeholders in terms of uh, waste manage uh, management, in terms of decarbonization, uh, adaptation to the new reality of, uh, of, the, of the green transition. But still, we're, we're only in the beginning of the transformation related to the mindset of Ukrainian citizens when it comes to the again, waste management, sorting of the garbage and et cetera. This is, this is the new reality, but the level of loyalty of people to that is, is rather high, I would say. Thank you very much you. indeed for your time. It's been wonderful speaking to you and, you. Uh, and have a good day. And I hope everything is successful for you this week. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> we will now have a five minute uh, change over session, bring some more chairs on, bring the panel down. So just bear with us for a second, please.
Okay, I think we are ready to go again. Uh, can people hear me over the? Good, good. Well, welcome, welcome back, everybody. So, so the second period of this panel is around um, the implementation of the journey to a green transition, and we have got a wonderful panel um, of speakers that represent policy, industry, industry, and think tanks. <laughs> My colleague Anthony uh, uh, at the end as an energy transition expert. Um, the way we're going to do this is that uh, I'm effectively going to ask a question of each speaker. They're going to talk for five, six, seven, ten minutes. Uh, then we're going to go through the panel and then we'll open up for question and answers uh, for anybody in the room or anybody online uh, towards the end, aiming to finish at 10.30. So let me, uh, I'll introduce the speakers one by one as I go through. So let me start in the far end and uh, the speakers are speaking in the order that they're sitting. Welcome very much to Irina Stavchuk, who's a Deputy Minister of Environment and Natural Resources, uh, formerly Executive Director of the ENGO EcoAction. Um, and my question to you, Irina, is, as we've just heard, NDC2 shows that Ukraine wants to play the ball on climate and tries to align its commitments with the EU Green Deal. What state policies, finance, carbon, pricing, regulation, could make more profound difference in deca decarbonization. So over to you for. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so first of all, I would like to say that over the last year, Ukraine has made a tremendous step in understanding of its climate policy and moving forward. We made uh, calculations and modeling in all the different sectors of economy to understand where our priorities could be, how much it would cost, and to come to a political deal with business and civil society what our climate target should be. And that was approved in a much more ambitious NDC. Uh, and uh, over the last year, we've also seen a very big change in the business society. So almost all the major company companies also announced the climate neutrality targets by 2030, 2040, 2050, which has not been before. Um, and uh, we are working hard on implementing and going forward with this uh, target. So the government started to develop the concrete action plan to understand what are the actions and transformations which have to happen in each sector, how we will finance it and how we will implement it. Um, it's very much linked to what the government was already planning to do with European integration. So all the major European integration reforms which have to happen, they will also definitely and strongly contribute to real action on decarbonization. And uh, we already made certain steps on waste management reform, its industrial pollution reform and uh, introduction of integrated permit system based, based on best available technologies. These are the issues of uh, biodiversity protection, and that's also very much related to European integration and climate saving. So of course, approval and acceptance of all these necessary reforms will bring real actions. But uh, it doesn't happen easily. It doesn't happen quickly. And uh, there are a lots of debates about each reform. And there are certain reasons to that. And these are the reasons of um, kind of different setup in Ukraine. We have huge problems with energy poverty. And every time we discuss um, certain carbon pricing, we find out that still um, customers and people don't always pay the full price for the energy, for electricity and for heat. And uh, adding up carbon price doesn't really help much. We have to first deal with this baseline problem. There is issue uh, for business companies that we also hear often is that in Ukraine, the bank loans interest rates are much higher than in EU. So if we introduce the similar regulations, it doesn't mean that for our companies, it's same easy to, to move forward. So um, finance in all this discussion plays a very big role. And uh, uh, that's why we are seeking and uh, 
uh, here agreements on international carbon mechanisms. We are seeking for international cooperation. We are seeking and also trying to redefine our internal environmental finance system. And as a Minister of Environment, uh, we initiated development of the Ukrainian Climate Fund with the idea that uh, carbon taxes, which are collected in Ukraine, could go as a concessional grant funds for a pro climate projects in cooperation with IFIs, in cooperation with Ukrainian development banks to be able to uh, put much stronger emphasis on uh, implementation of necessary transitions. Thank you very much. Uh, can I just uh, ask a subsidiary question? You said about biodiversity. Yes. That's my background. I'm, I'm also a professor of ecology as well as a research director. So uh, how is your thinking on biodiversity and what is that linkage to climate change? There is a direct linkage on uh, preservation of biodiversity and uh, nature ecosystems. <laughs> And uh, uh, it, it's a complex issue because when the agricultural sector in Ukraine has such a major role and with the land reform, there is much more appetite to transfer the valuable ecosystems to the agriculture. That's where we have the, 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 the problem, basically. Thank you very much indeed. So move, moving on, uh, the next speaker is Dimitro Loss, who's chairman of the board of uh, UBTA the Ukrainian Business and Trade Association, which unites export oriented industry with offices in Brussels and Kiev. Dimitro, over to you. Oh no, I've got to ask you a question, sorry. I'm losing track of my, 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 my strand. When you, look at more, uh, when you look at the more ambitious Ukrainian NDC2, so the one from July, from the perspective of industry, where do you see the main challenges in delivering on commitments? and what policies could play a role as a positive multiplier in the green transition? Thank you for your question, actually. You know, uh, the first thing I have to say that Ukrainian uh, business is totally in line with Green Deal agenda, uh, which was stated uh, on June uh, 2021 on meeting of uh, G7 leaders. And yes, we are eager to reach decarbonization as soon as possible still, we need to remember that we are living in a quite compl uh, complicated surrounding, remembering our war in East, annexation of Crimea, and some of the other issues. From other side, Ukrainian business is ready to develop programs together with government, sectoral programs, which will help and show the roadmap of how to transform different sectors, joining again in one ambitious goal, to reach decarbonization level stated in a national determined contribution. And regarding national determined contribution, I also have to, have to say that Ukrainian business showed its ambition and its desire to find mutually beneficial solutions with the government, and because actually there was quite hard fight with our government for trying to find good solution, but now it's found and now business and government together can move uh, towards uh, joint goal. Still, uh, we have to remember that uh, even now, Ukrainian business is living in quite complicated surrounding, just uh, meeting financial problems, uh, which are not very common for businesses from other countries. For example, during our transformation system, during adopting the legislative base of Ukraine to European standards, we already have a lot of, a lot of financial issues. And, uh, it's only the beginning of the way we have the program developed till 2026. So um, that's, the, fir that's the, fir the first and main uh, problem which we, we, which we find. Another one that we need to find maybe some kind of mechanism established by our government for internal financing, that is what, what a deputy minister said already, which will be focused definitely on a green transformation, not on anything else. Still, um, to finally answer your question, the con my conclusion will be that without uh, severe financial help from international institutions, including those from European Union, for Ukrainian business, it will be really hard to reach its ambitious goals, to decarbonize. And actually here on this panel, we have two leaders which already started their complicated by, but 
necessary way towards this direction, DTEC and MHP. Thank you very much indeed. Um, moving on to our next uh, panelist, Maxim Timchenko to my right, who is uh, a DTEC CEO since 2005. Uh, uh, that's Ukraine's leading energy company and private investment firm. Uh, also member of the World Economic Forum's uh, electricity governance community. Uh, welcome, Maxime. Uh, DTEC has a mixed portfolio of carbon generated energy and energy from renewable sources. Considering Ukraine's NDC2, what is the most viable strategy for companies like yours to advance a carbon neutral agenda? What should be done to attract more FDI into green modernization? Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for us to be here. And I think it's a special event, not only for, for our company, but for the whole country, uh, since Ukraine uh, is represented at the highest level. And I think it's a good sign for, for everybody that uh, now Green Deal and decarbonization is part of the political agenda of, of the Ukrainian president. Um, I think that Ukraine has a unique opportunity to become leader of decarbonization in Eastern Europe. And with all ambitious, ambitious goals we, we set, um, I have a uh, very uh, confident position that such a goals can be achieved by combination of efforts of the government, society, and business. And uh, for us, it's something special because two years ago, we announced about climate neutrality of the tech by 2040. Uh, in January 2020, we were the first who brought a Green Deal agenda to uh, Green, Green Deal to, to the agenda of our government organizing roundtable in World Economic Forum. At the end of 2020, we uh, publicly presented long-term strategy of the tech where we announced different ambitious goals, including reaching th not less than 33% in our generation mix by renewables. And uh, for us, what is important is, lead, is to lead by example. Talking about renewable sector today, we invested more than 1.5 billion euros into building new capacities in wind and solar. Uh, being one of coal, major coal producers in the country, we announced about uh, our active development in just transition way uh, to phase out coal. And uh, during this year, we closed two coal mines out of 11, but again, in a responsible way, uh, making sure that, that our people have another job and they, they're not left, left behind. I think that uh, innovation is playing a crucial role in, in developing decarbonization, uh, uh, decarbonization agenda. And for us, uh, not only development of renewable, renewable capacity, but also energy storage is part, part of the process. We built first industrial energy storage capacity in Ukraine uh, during 2021. So all these examples is that uh, corporate center not waiting for changes in government policy and not even you know, in any favorable conditions try to, to lead this, this process. And in my strong opinion that uh, the role of government now is to build framework for corporate center so that we understand that our further development of renewables is uh, supported by the government. That, uh, development of new innovative technologies like hydrogen or small modular reactors as part of transition processes is also supported and financed by, by Ukrainian government institution and by, by foreign institutions. So I think if we uh, bring all these joint efforts into, into the, uh, into the uh, process, then we can be quite confident that such as ambitious goals can be achieved. Thank you very much. Moving on to my left-hand side now is Alexander Dombrovsky, Vice President of MHP and President of MHP Eco Energy and Chairman of the Board of Public Union Global 100% RE Ukraine. Um, MHP is an agro and industrial holding, the largest producer and exporter of chicken in Ukraine, I understand. Um, 
so my question to you, in view of the upcoming climate impacts, including on the productivity of yields, how can Ukraine build a climate smart, resilient economy in the agricultural sector? Do you see more risks or opportunities? Thank you very much uh, for this question. I would like to say that I'm particularly pleased to see so many Ukrainian friends here, such a powerful team in such an important place where indeed we are taking uh, 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 massive decisions, huge responsibility. And by the way, uh, we see the opportunity uh, and our challenge in actually feeding the world. And that's one of the largest missions for our country. Ukraine is a high tech agro-industrial country. And perhaps if you could show the second slide, I'll stand up so that I could demonstrate. I will illustrate the company established in uh, 1989. We had uh, an IPO at the London Stock Exchange. We export our products to 80 countries of the world, and we have more than 32,000 of employees in the company. That is a huge company uh, contributing to uh, food uh, security and environment uh, security. And when we hear this question, Ukraine is a, um, a raw material country because we export uh, raw materials. I don't think it's correct because we have many companies uh, uh, at every stage we uh, add value and export products with the uh, high value added to compete in the foreign markets and uh, the fact that we export to more than 80 countries of the world this testifies to the fact that we are uh, competing for this market next slide please and uh, uh, we also are aware that more than 70% of CO2 emissions and uh, global warming issues is the uh, issue of using so-called so dirty energy. Uh, we decided that, that we're not going that way. We are going the way of the green transformation. Next slide, please. Our key objective for us, uh, uh, this ambitious uh, uh, objective up to 2030 to become a, a carbon neutral company. This is a very challenging objective objective, but we believe we're capable of achieving that. The other objective important for us, in 2030, we want to be an energy independent company. That is all the energy resources necessary for in-house production. We want to produce them inside, in-house the company. Uh, the instruments we're using for that in order to answer your question, to demonstrate that uh, Ukraine has real potential uh, uh, chances to re reach these ambitious uh, objectives. First of all, this energy uh, efficiency technologies, the uh, modern technologies, uh, um, substituting this dirty energy with renewable energy, renewable energy we have in large capacities, uh, using circular economy models, which is in the basis of uh, uh, green transformation of European green information and also innovations. Next slide, please. In general, we should be uh, should understand that uh, renewable energy is uh, more traditional than the one we uh, take as a traditional one with fossil fuels, because traditionally both the wind, the sun and water, both in Europe and in Ukraine, were, used to be used as a clean energy resource. And to a large extent, we just want to come back to our roots, historic roots, and to the potential each country has, uh, including Ukraine. Next slide, please. Energy efficiency. Unfortunately, um, it is, uh, uh, there's a, uh, historically, there's a, uh, 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 legacy program is uh, inefficiency, energy inefficiency of the uh, Ukrainian economy, and we can compare all this, and this is automatically results in huge uh, emissions which we have to to cut, uh, and then working on. Uh, cutting, uh, decreasing the energy uh, consuming of uh, our Ukraine economy. We all be, at the same time, we'll be working on the cutting CO2 emissions. In my opinion, energy efficiency should be our national idea. And you can see that uh, MHP, our company, uh, holding in terms of uh, energy efficiency uh, 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 ratio is among the best uh, uh, countries in terms of energy efficiency. At the same time, we have this huge research resources we need to still uh, make use. Next slide, please. 
this is a key element of our circular economy model as a biogas complex we built in Ukraine, in Ladizhin, in Dnipropetrovsk region. Total capacity approximately 18.5 megawatts. Uh, we have another complex uh, operating in Slovenia. Exactly, that's exactly this element provides us an opportunity to uh, to process all wastes into green, uh, clean energy, which we use later on for producing our clean products and organic products we have at output. Uh, we use it to uh, return to the soil in order to um, to uh, renew the uh, yields and uh, productivity. Next slide, please. This is our circular economy model. Next slide, please. And uh, a very important element of this is innovations. I believe that res to resolve the issue of uh, global warming, not using uh, innovations for any sector, uh, agriculture and chemistry, it's not possible. That's why we uh, invest a lot in investments, in uh, innovations. We believe that we need an absolutely different model. and. Uh, technologically different and we uh, cooperate with many companies uh, including DTAC company present here and via mobil mobilizing uh, resources uh, together with DTA uh, to mobilize these resources because we need to invest a lot in uh, innovations and in conclusion I would like to thank I would like to wish all of us uh, a great success in this because the objectives we have uh, as a uh, MHP and for Ukraine very ambitious and we need to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can can I ask a, a follow up question? Um, the uh, it was mentioned earlier about part of building the resilience of the of the food system, the agricultural system was thinking about shortening supply chains and e eating more local produce. Is your vision for Ukrainian agriculture to be the breadbasket of Europe with its wheat production, or is it thinking about changing the agricultural system in the way that you've just been outlining and introducing a different form of, of agriculture? Well, first of all, we are resolving the issue of uh, food security for Ukraine, and we uh, put our uh, contribution into resolving global issues. We believe that both world, the world and Ukraine uh, in, is in, are in need of new green economy model. And for that, we need to transform a lot, uh, taking consideration that we're, we're a vertically integrated company, taking into consideration that uh, starting from um, uh, tilling or soil, uh, uh, growing feed, uh, 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 all uh, stages. We have many business stages. We need to modernize each stage. Each stage has to be ecologically, environmentally clean. We need to minimize uh, uh, the food uh, carbon footprint at each stage in order for all the business uh, chain uh, to be carbon zero, which is a huge uh, task, but we are clearly understanding the task, the way we need to move forward. And naturally for that, we need uh, the dialogue with the government. We need the support from the state, from the government, uh, and uh, we need more of that. But at least we're optimistic, we remain optimistic and we move forward. Now, our, our final speaker this morning uh, is my colleague, uh, uh, Anthony Froggart, who is Deputy Director of the Environment and Society Programme and senior research fellow. Um, Anthony, I don't have a question for you, I don't think. Um, oh yes, sorry, it's, it's, it's on the next page. From what you've heard today, because we've heard quite a lot across different, uh, different areas uh, about Ukraine's green tra transition, where do you think as a kind of independent commentator, where do you think Ukraine gets it right? And what policy actions could have the most positive transformative effects and are there any missing pieces in the puzzle? So over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you for arranging this great event. I mean, it's, it's 
been a logistical challenge uh, starting at nine o'clock on the first day of the COP, um, but I, I think it's really been worthwhile. So just wanted to in some way summarize some of the issues that have been addressed today and add my, my comments to it. I mean, I think we all know the importance of Ukraine uh, from an energy perspective, uh, given its geographical significance and that it's a transit route for uh, oil and gas to Western Europe. I think what's less well known is the importance of Ukraine in terms of agricultural products. Uh, and during the 2019-2020, Ukraine shipped 57 million tonnes of grain to international markets, representing about 16% of the global export. So it really is a, a huge producer um, to uh, grain worldwide. Furthermore, in, in terms of its domestic importance, agri the agri agricultural share of export revenue increased from 26% in 2012 to 45% in 2020, amounting to 22 billion dollars. But as with all countries, the impacts of climate change are being felt in Ukraine and particularly in the agricultural sector. Consequently, we're starting to see, see a, a, a fall in exports due to smaller harvests caused by severe drought conditions. By March 2020, grain exports were reportedly down 16% on the previous year. So we're starting to see the climate impacts uh, in Ukraine in, in some ways in a more real uh, and vicious vicious way uh, than in other parts of the world. Ukraine is also a significant producer and user of fossil fuels and it extracted in 2018 14 million tons of oil equivalent of coal, 16 million tons of oil equivalent of gas and 2.3 million tons of crude oil. It's also got a nuclear power program and a small but growing renewable energy industry. Ukraine also has significant fossil fuel reserves. It has the seventh largest reserves of coal in the world and the second largest reserves of, of gas in Europe. So it is a, has a significant interest in fossil fuels. Despite this, nearly a, th a third of Ukraine's total energy demand is imported, which includes around 80% 80, 80 of oil consumption, a third of natural gas and about 50% of coal. And Russia remains an important supplier of, of energy, either directly or indirectly to Ukraine. In 2020, Approximately 7.3% of Ukraine's, only 7.3% of Ukraine's electricity was generated from new renewables. So around 12.5% if you include hydro, with the goal of, I, I believe it's 25% by, by 2035, but I, I heard something slightly different in the translation. So I hope that that's, that's correct. But many studies show that this uh, is a relatively modest target given the capacity uh, uh, and, and the resources uh, that Ukraine has. The International, Renewable Energy the International Renewable Energy Agency estimates that onshore wind could be 320 gigawatts and solar 70 gigawatts by 2030. All of this based on a competitive uh, cost competitiveness, which is up from 6.5 gigawatts today. So really multiple folds increase uh, in the deployment of renewables. And as we know, the deployment of renewables will simultaneously address energy security, economic competitive, and climate change. It really is the win-win-win-win solution. Similarly, as we've heard uh, in terms of energy efficiency, due to the economy structure and building and industrial inefficiency, the country's energy efficiency is low, over twice uh, the world average, and uh, as was shown very clearly in the previous presentation. So absolutely at the forefront of the, the journey to the green transition must be energy efficiency. Furthermore, given the EU's clear drive to decarbonisation and the desire for greater coordination and cooperation between the EU and Ukraine, climate change is likely to be a cornerstone of the future relationship, which we've heard very clearly today. And it's maybe worth reflecting upon the EU-Ukraine's uh, summit statement from last month, where it said, the EU side welcomed Ukraine's ambition to approximate its policies and regulations with the European Green New Deal. So the, the Green Deal in Europe being at the heart of Ukraine is again one of these key issues in terms of the, the roadmap for uh, the energy transition. One of the, the other topics was, was mentioned was in, in relation to carbon pricing and the impact that that has on fuel poverty. But we know that in, in Ukraine, the carbon price is remarkably low. Uh, uh, as I saw it, it's about 0.3 uh, dollars a ton. I hope again, with experts on the panel, that this is correct. Um, and if we compare that to Europe, where the price is around 60 euros a ton, and the global price of around three 
dollars a ton. So the Ukrainian price is around a tenth of the global average. Um, yeah, there's much work to be done. And I know that Ukraine is, is discussing the introduction of an emissions trading system with legislative adoption, hopefully uh, within the next couple of years. The introduction of a more reflective carbon price in Ukraine is important for the domestic decarbonization, as we've heard, but it will also be stimulated by the EU in terms of its proposals for the introduction of a carbon border tax adjustment mechanism. This mechanism is expected to enter into force in January of, of 2023, firstly with a transition period until 2026. So it, 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 this will be the, the time in which importers don't have to buy credits, but they will be reviewed on a quarterly basis. So we will start to see the process being put in place uh, with obligations for reporting. Now, CBAM is going to be introduced sector by sector, starting with cement, iron and steel, aluminium and fertilizers, and el the electricity sector. Therefore, this is a particular significant to manufacturers in Ukraine, as we've heard today. Final two points. One is just to recognize that as was mentioned, we have seen remarkable falls in terms of the amount of CO2 uh, being produced in Ukraine from 720 million tons in 1988 to 230 million tons in 2019. As was mentioned, this isn't because of a, a miraculous green revolution. It, it's also driven by changes in the economy, economic restructuring, and to some extent, uh, deliberate uh, decarbonization. And, and so what we've seen is a 62% fall in greenhouse gas emissions compared to 1990 levels, which is why the, the NDC submitted in 2016 was seen to be extremely weak indeed, uh, with a target of only 40% below uh, 1990 levels uh, by 2013, by 30. Uh, as we've heard, Ukraine has submitted a revised NDC where it's committed to a 65% reduction uh, in uh, greenhouse gas emissions conditional uh, and as well as a net zero target by 2060. Both of these are important, but again, I think people feel that Ukraine really could go much further, and, and this was mentioned by many of the panelists today in terms of the opportunities that this will de deliver. So in summary, like many countries, Ukraine has difficult and hugely significant choices ahead. As I've mentioned, it has significant fossil fuel reserves and an economy uh, and infrastructure that is highly inefficient. Uh, while its economy is heavily dependent on agricultural exports, which are increasingly impacted by climate change. Furthermore, its strategic direction is increasingly tied to the EU, what, which itself is accelerating, accelerating decarbonisation. Therefore, while there are clearly conflicting drivers, the overarching di direction for U Ukraine, at least for me and, and for many of the speakers that we've heard today, is clear to rapidly decarbonisation and therefore increase energy independence and economic security. The foundation of this transition is, increase, is, is increased energy efficiency and renewable energy, probably supported by a more reflective carbon price. However, such a move, move will need internationally, primarily EU support to enable a just and rapid, sorry, to enable a just and rapid transition, particularly renewable energy and energy efficiency and avoiding carbon lock-in including the reduction of state subsidies for fossil fuels, supporting affected regions and workers, and addressing existing social and economic equalities, and ensuring a transparent and inclusive process. None of this will be easy, but only by addressing all of these questions, all of these issues altogether, will the process be environmentally and socially sustainable. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, a very um, uh, good oversight of uh, many of the things that have been talked about today. Now, we now have a period of um, 40 minutes or so for uh, questions either from the floor or online. Um, we're going to have a, a roving microphone that Ludi's got. I can see one question in the room already. So let's start off in the room and then I'll take the next question online. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mariana Baniarska. I represent Ukrainian 
I represent Ukrainian NGOs here, and I have, of course, a few comments and few questions. Um, Ukrainian uh, Climate Network also developed a position for this COP. I've got this document and I uh, can share if anybody is interested. And um, my comments are the following. First of all, I want to emphasize that uh, Ukrainian embassy is on reduction of overall emissions, but actually it allows uh, the growth of uh, emissions in industry, in industry and agricultural sector. So I would uh, be interested in comment on that. Um, and I have also the question, if um, uh, Ukraine is uh, aiming at, uh, and maybe if Ukraine is going to uh, set the target of reduction uh, from uh, goal, uh, coal industry, maybe in this forum too. And the second question is um, whether Ukraine has an intention to develop maybe a, um, a extra me uh, maybe a, a, a mechanisms uh, on using of the funds that are going to be spent on uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions, because we know that Ukraine has an experience of misuse of such environmental funds in uh, the past. So whether there are some uh, plans to develop uh, more effective uh, mechanisms of using uh, environmental allocations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's ask those so those two questions around the decarbonization to industry and agriculture and then if i turn to you to talk about the, the green funds so um first question uh Dimitra. Yes, uh, kind of answer <clears throat> to the first question because to create something and to reduce something you need to establish a national program or at least sectoral program and that's why i'm happy to present here what was created by our team ukrainian business trade association team uh what we call ukrainian food transformation system or smart green deal for ukrainian agriculture which is actually the number of steps which ukraine uh, or at least agricultural sector needs to undertake to reach its goal uh, it's uh, already uh, went through public talks we already obtained uh, positive answers from Minister of Agriculture and exactly that's our desire that all of other sectors will create the same programs for them which will be totally collected to the national legislative uh, base or and to European and that will lead us to the goal which uh, we actually want to achieve the decarbonization but I think that on question number two better uh, one of our ministries will answer I can say that, I can answer to that. They, when we talk about decarbonization, we have new challenges, challenges we hadn't faced before. For example, we now have to follow very deep diagnostics of CO2 emissions in agrarian sector in all the technological processes. And these audits we never conducted before. It's a new thing for us. And we have just had elements of that. And I would like to say that our company, MHP, has signed an agreement with LTEC, a British company, so that we conduct this diagnostics, conduct this audit, so that every agrarian technological process could be identified very clearly uh, and analyzed for CO2 emissions. But at the same time, we have to understand what kind of tools, what kind of technological uh, elements uh, we have to use or change so that our traditional decisions could not lead to the new CO2 emissions? How can we lead the zero emissions? Uh, and of course, quite a lot of uh, new challenges and we have to work together with the government, with other ministries, otherwise we can't do it on our own. So, yes, we are the leaders in uh, trying to reach decarbonization, and we are happy to share this experience too. Thank you very much. Over to you, Irina. Thank you. I will comment also on the first question first and then on the second one. So, we had really heated debates 
on the industry and agricultural sector emissions. And from the industry perspective, I think it's a fair solution because we understand that existing industry has really to decrease its emissions per unit of product they produce. But we also have to leave the space for the new industry to develop and uh, with the war, with all the declines that we had, we really want Ukraine to develop as an industrial country. Uh, in terms of agriculture, uh, yes, indeed, there are uh, certain technologies which have to be implemented by companies, and uh, they're also helping to uh, improve the resource efficiency of the activities. But I think the major issue in the agricultural sector is that we really have to put the question on decreasing of arable lands in Ukraine and uh, transforming certain territories to nature ecosystems. And that requires completely new mechanisms. It's possible in uh, procedure, but there has to be certain stimulation for that. And that's something that we have to develop. And that's something that can bring much more emission reductions. On the financial side, um, it's a complex of issues because whatever transformation you take, uh, you have to find out what are the mechanisms which are bad to best to deliver. It can be regulatory, it can be economic instruments which put in place, which enable the system. And then the last one is the co-financing or grant financing for the areas where you cannot deal just with the economic and regulatory instruments. Um, and um, speaking about environmental funds that we have on the national level, that's not much funds also because the carbon taxes that we have are very low, the one which goes to the state. So if we are to develop certain financial programs to support decarbonization and has to go together with increasing of the taxes so that everybody understands, okay, we increase the task, task taxes, but we also develop certain programs which help to transform quicker. So that's the vision that we try to build on and try to implement. Thank you very much. Uh, moving to the uh, online questions, I'm going to uh, group two. Um, uh, one from Oksana Aliyeva. Um, NDC prescribes green, prescribed greenhouse gas emissions decreases is foreseen most in the energy sector. Is there an intention to phase out coal and declare a, a date, perhaps at this COP, to join the coalition of other countries on ending coal power? Uh, and a question from Roland Smith, in the context of decarbonisation, is it possible to imagine Ukraine ending its dependence on natural gas imports from Russia? Who would like to mute? Well, uh, as you know, the tech is, is quite, quite significant player in coal in Ukraine. At the same time, uh, we have quite clear vision uh, uh, and strategy regarding phase out of coal, at least as, as uh, part of our company process. We are the first company who joined Powering Past Coal Alliance <coughs> initiative, and I believe that this is a uh, first step and the other companies should follow us, including Ukraine as a state. And I hope that this announcement can be made very soon by Ukrainian government because having such an important uh, part of generation mix, Ukraine cannot avoid stating clear position about coal phase out. But uh, it's quite an important uh, topic for Ukraine from the side of energy security. Because taking current situation, we have a uh, quite critical situation with coal stocks before winter season. And uh, phasing out, as I already said, should be part of responsible process and social process in our country. That's why we are waiting for clear strategy and signals from the government how this process will be run on the future. But definitely our company being in, in this green transition, as I already said, moving from coal to renewables and to other technologies, uh, definitely will lead this process in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Anybody want to tackle the uh, Russian gas imports? I can continue. <laughs> continue, Max. <laughs> yes, because uh, you know that we are the major private uh, gas producer in the country. 
And for the last five years, we increased volume of production by more than four times. And I think it's another, uh, another case where we lead by example. Uh, Ukraine have all grounds to be so self-sufficient in gas uh, supply. As you already mentioned, uh, one of our speakers, we have the second largest reserve for gas in, in the country. Now the matter how we can convert this advantage into real life. And I, I already, as I mentioned, having such a huge increase of gas production uh, and for this year, we'll have record two BCM of production by our company. Uh, we show everybody that they realistic. We need professional people, we need uh, investments, and we need technologies. All of this uh, we can get, and I'm, I'm confident that subject to, to all these uh, factors, Ukraine can be self-sufficient in gas uh, production by 2030. One, one is <laughs> Okay, I will also add quickly, so from the recent information from the Ministry of Energy, they're working on the new energy strategy, and they want to build it based on the NDC and on the goals that we have also on decarbonization. Um, they're, they're not planning to build new coal facilities, as what they say and announce, and uh, they're now calculating on the dates when Ukraine can actually phase out coal. On the gas issue, I think I want to anchor what Anthony was saying about energy efficiency, because that's the key issue. And Ukraine really has a huge potential in buildings, in municipalities, in, in, in many companies. But uh, that, 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 that's also not very easy to deliver due to uh, historical ways how people live in houses. They have to organize a condo minimum, they have to take a loan. So these are all not only pure economic issues which you can put a price and then people act. It's also there are a lot of cultural and uh, other issues which have to be uh, taken into account. So do you have a kind of mental time scale for, for dealing with the, the housing stock? We have, we are on that journey from yeah. 2013 and uh, there were, good programs set simple prog programs to support energy efficiency in buildings and actually transform the societal approach how you live in your house in a multi-floor houses and we continue with the energy efficiency fund in cooperation with the EU and Ukraine is uh, adding the resources it's not flying very quickly because the area is so complicated but uh, I believe we are on the right way and we just have to spread to um, municipal and state buildings. We have to have programs for uh, energy efficiency in municipal wastewater and heat systems so that these uh, all in combination can bring much more efficiency and reduction of consumption. Thank you very much. Just, just one, one example. Uh, if we will have energy efficiency like in Poland, for example, yeah? We can decrease energy consums consumption more than two times. And in this case, we will be not import country. We can export just some energy resource. It's, it's, it's key position for our country, it's energy efficiency. It's very, very important. I absolutely agree with Irina. Thank you very much. Uh, can we have the microphone down here? Oh, I was coming. <laughs> oh, Ludi, you're going to get a lot of exercise today. Anthony wants to comment. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, maybe just to emphasize this efficiency point, and I just wonder in, in terms of where we are, there, there's discussions in terms of energy transitions. So we have the Powering Pass Coal Alliance, we have support for electric vehicles, we have the financing issues, but everyone knows that for many parts of the world, it's energy efficiency. This is, this is what we need to do in the next nine years in order to meet the 2030 target. It has to be energy efficiency. So maybe Ukraine can, can launch a new initiative on global creating energy efficiency in order to meet the, the 2030 targets. Because it is, as you said, if, if only Ukraine moved to the Polish standard of efficiency, which isn't the highest in Europe, it would, very easily meet its target. So it really is that, and why? Can, how can we make energy efficiency more attractive internationally for the negotiators? 
Thank you, Anthony. That's uh, that, that's an important challenge, and uh, <laughs> <I've> got... <laughs> thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. No, um, Indy, thank you so much. You've mentioned a very important topic, and we've been just discussing this issue ahead of the recent EU-Ukraine summit, which has been held in uh, in Ukraine, uh, in Kiev, and um, the president announced the um, uh, the multi uh, the global national program of uh, energy efficiency and thermal modernization of uh, uh, private and uh, public buildings and we have agreed to uh, to launch another financial program for that financed by european union and we hope that it will already be announced ahead of the uh, upcoming eastern partnership summit in december this is a very important dimension and i personally vis visited one of the very small cities uh, the outspaces of the odessa region uh, which is the sea region, it's uh, called Ismail, and they have already severely invested in energy efficiency, it, and it brings a lot of resources back to the government. But uh, I think if Ukraine is taking some leadership and something, is is something with, that will be related to transfer of technologies and agri-sector, is where Ukraine has a proper expertise, proper capacity, proper amount of success stories, and uh, uh, this is part of Ukraine's file, which is undiscussable and where we gain a strong authority among international partners. And uh, this is where we have a good example when the businesses, based on its experience, produce the agenda, which, uh, let's say, facilitates the discussions that we're having and are having in Brussels. So, um, but when it comes to energy efficiency, financial cooperation, um, different uh, initiatives like MESAN and et cetera, we're here already collaborating with our partners. We're contributing with our input. But when it comes to Ukraine, where Ukraine is standing as a leader and pioneer in some agenda, this would be the agri sector so far. Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody else have a question in here? Yes. And then we'll move back to the virtual audience. I'm Alexander I'm Alexander Brikalov. I'm uh, the mayor of uh, Mirograd in Donetsk region. Could you please tell us, in your opinion, the concept uh, drafted by the government, to what extent it uh, answers all the questions uh, the municipalities are interested in? I mean the terms of implementation for this concept. Uh, um, I mean also the register of uh, coal mines and gradual closing down of uh, coal mines, and whether there is a the programs uh, developed to support uh, cities and uh, towns uh, to be transformed. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, directed at the government. <laughs> Who would like to take that one? Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. So I would suggest that we would have this discussion back in Kiev, you know, because <laughs> we're both from Ukraine. Um, but uh, still, the, all the well, um, uh, this is basically the, the substance of the discussion we have that, yes, of course, we have the strategy and the vision, uh, but now we have to understand how do we back it up with the finances. Uh, this is the, the uh, logic the government is following, but uh, when it comes to the regional leadership, so you're a mayor, as far as I understand, of uh, uh, one of the Ukrainian citizens, based on the, uh, on the general line put on by the government, you should form your own strategies. And then when you identify the priority areas of the development of your region, then we will be able to identify the amount of resources and attention we should allocate to your region. Particularly, I can, uh, I can only name once again the region I've been just a week ago, where it is very easy to understand the strategy of its development, the priorities, the areas, and the areas to invest in. So um, uh, that's why uh, giving the answer to your question is that the general framework is there. Uh, the very particular framework should be formed by you for us to be able to support you. 
So, but uh, uh, there will be a number of sectoral strategies, like I said, there's the energy efficiency when the government resources will be allocated to that, the international resources will be prioritized to that. So um, if there are areas of your region which you would uh, put attention and focus on, that would be your priorities, which will be then supported by the government. But also the other priority is the um, just coal transition and for those regions who will be subjected to this process there will be a particular attention of course also thank you very much olga you're doing overtime today um we'll uh, take a question from the online audience now which is andrei andrusevich would the speakers comment on the eu proposal for carbon and border adjustment mechanism cbam both in the context of the EU-Ukraine relations and in a wider context of achieving Paris Agreement goals. So who would like to take a, uh, take a stab at answering a question about CBAMs? I can start with, with, with and then maybe Thank somebody you, wants to continue. Uh, we understand the nature of CBAM and why EU is introducing, because the certain types of industry has not been reducing emissions for many, many years. But we are also very much concerned how it will impact our economy. And uh, of course, we are holding consultations with EU on uh, basis that we have a US association agreement that we are part of the energy community so that we have certain uh, special approach and certain way how we as Ukraine uh, deal with it. Uh, there is also a question on this mechanism that the carbon pricing has to be similar in other countries. You can do it effectively when you have emission trading system, but having it with the pricing of EU uh, mean, means that it's, it's not possible to be implementable in such a short time. EU was going to that for 20 years. If you're talking about carbon pricing, it's not similar to what EU ETS is because carbon pricing, it's kind of tax when you pay for every ton of emissions, while in EU ETS, it's flexible for certain sectors. So we are still to find our way and we are still uh, not fully understand how EU will formulate its approach and how a national circumstances will be taken into account for different countries. Thank you. I will add actually. All right. Possible, definitely. And I will <clears throat> continue what uh, Madam Marina said already. But uh, the question is uh, the CBAM for business for what? Actually, definitely, it's the biggest question of financing what will be inside Ukraine. But I think that my colleagues from business will vote for the question why not to make CBAM on eastern border of Ukraine? Why should we do it on western border of Ukraine? And if European Union treating us like neighbors who have a cessational agreement, that's what we discussed previously, why not to establish enough programs to help Ukrainian business to make green transformation as soon as possible? That will solve all the issues. And actually, CBAM on the eastern border, border will help to find resources to make it not only uh, on international money. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Maxi. yes, I can, on behalf of industry, not only energy. So I wouldn't say that CBAM should be treated as a threat for Ukraine. I think that this discussion about CBAM should uh, initiate our internal discussion, either we good in our homework. So first talking about the industry, I think that carbon pricing coming to the levels of European Union is unavoidable in Ukraine. And what we have now from the industries and from even from our sister company called Metinvest, which is one of the largest producer of steel in not only in the country, is that let's develop joint projects so that we have enough green energy for our own consumption. And this is how PPA as a new tool to uh, support development of renewables can start developing in our, in our country. So I think time will come when uh, industries and industrial companies approach those who are in development of renewables and start signing long-term contract as a basis for financing this, uh, this uh, project. It's one example. The other example in the whole context of our conversation is about integration of Ukrainian energy system into INSOE. And this is one of the most important strategic moves, not for our industry, but for the whole country. And I hope that government will do whatever is necessary that we, by 2024, will be part of uh, INSOE uh, European energy system. 
And then if, and the next step will be market coupling. And if Ukraine is preparing to become part of European energy market, that we shouldn't, shouldn't afraid see BAM or any other things. We, we should implement emission trading system as it was already agreed, but we should have some transition. We cannot jump immediately from, uh, from one euro to, to 60 euro payment per ton. And this is what should be respected from, from European part. But finally, if, if we talk about European integration, we see us as a part of European family, we all should be prepared to pay proper price for, for carbon and to be competitive working in European economy. Thank you. Anthony. Yes, sorry. Um, number of points. Firstly, I, I, I think we all recognize that there needs to be some, ex we need to pay the price of externalities in, in the goods that are produced. And carbon pricing is, is one mechanism to do that. It's not the only one, but in order to there to be a, a faster transition, there needs to be a, a commercial price for the environmental damage that we do. I think secondly, it's important to recognize that there are lots of non-price barriers to stop the introduction of new technologies. So carbon pricing isn't the bullet, the silver bullet that changes everything. It, it's, it must be part of a package of other measures. I mean, again, we come back to the discussion on energy efficiency. We know it, it makes sense economically, but yeah, it doesn't happen. So there's a whole series of non-tariff barriers. The third point to recognize, which it, my colleague just mentioned is, it, it, it's a complicated and difficult process and it may take some time to do. Um, to give an example, Brexit in the UK, we've left the, emission, the EU emissions trading system and we've now set up our own system and we're still not linked back to the ETS. So there's technical issues, there's political issues. It is, it is a complicated issue. My third point is there is a movement towards global carbon pricing. And I think we need to recognize that. And we can see that now around 20% of global carbon is priced in some way. And that has changed significantly in the last year because you, uh, China has introduced an emissions trading system for the first time. Uh, and that is larger than the EU ETS. So, and it just covers the, the power sector. So it is a global trend and we're moving in that direction. There is a huge price differential, as I mentioned. So the, the global average price now is $3 a ton of, of carbon and the EU ETS is 60. So we have to try to have some sort of harmonization, but it's not gonna happen overnight with this huge differential that exists. But I do think the CBAM is an important process for carbon literacy. And this is exactly what we saw when we introduced the emissions trading in system in the EU, when the UK was part of the EU back in 2005, it, it, it in, encouraged businesses or required businesses and a whole other sectors to start understand what carbon means and what how carbon will affect their business. And I think CBAM will do that. It will help to drive carbon literacy in, in many countries that have resisted having these discussions. So in that way, I think it's really important, but it raises huge methodological questions, which need time to work through and understand. And I hope that's the rationale behind the transition period. There is a trend, an introductory period with the CBAM that will enable non-monetary exchange, but yet understanding how the system works and accounting in the right way. So I do hope that that period is taken seriously so that there's two or three years in which we can get this right. But I do recognize it's highly politi politically contentious. Ukraine is just one country that is, uh, ha has doubts about it, has concerns about it. China is others, U US is others. So, um, but I think, recognizing that it, there are concerns, but recognizing it is in the general good for there to be more carbon literacy around the world and to, to develop mechanisms to have externalities being paid, I think is a really important process. Thank you very much, Anthony. Um, anybody else in the audience have a question? Can't see any hands. So moving down to the um, online questions again. Um, uh, let's go to uh, a question from, from Virginia Rigoni. In which industry and sector, to the panel, would you like to see more ambitious targets for 2030 to facilitate Ukraine's green transitions? And has your, has your view and expectations 
on the balance of different sectors decarbonisation plans changed in the last three to five years. So does anybody want to tackle that? Where are the sectors that could be more ambitious? Where are the sectors that are, are already being super ambitious? And how quickly is that, 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 that changing? I can start. Yes, yeah. please. Um, so when we started uh, working on NDC, it was a process of modeling with times model and uh, calculations on what, where the biggest potential lies and where the cheapest transformations could be. But when we took these numbers and went out to talk to ministries, to sectors, to businesses, it turned out that in certain areas, even when we see the big potential, it cannot happen quickly. So one of the sector is energy efficiency in buildings. And uh, the model shows that economically, there's a huge potential and it really pays back. But when we look at the practical level of implementation and how difficult it is, we had to reduce the overall ambition for this sector. Uh, another one, which is also not very easy, is the transport sector. I think it's difficult in many, many countries. And uh, in Ukraine in particular, because uh, the public transport is not, it's actually underinvested heavily. And in many cities, we have more and more cars. The railway is also underinvested and uh, in a very bad situation. So the uh, uh, road transport takes over in the passenger uh, transitions and in the freight transitions. So these are the areas where there has to be a much stronger combination of reforms and investments which is Ukraine struggling to deliver. But also with stronger EU policies in the transport sector, we have more cars in Ukraine, second used cars, and uh, very difficult debates in the parliament. So from environmental perspective, we as a ministry, of course, are not in favor of letting these cars in uh, without any major payments uh, for environmental pollution. But people want to have better lives, more decent lives, they want, to, to get this uh, quality uh, and uh, yeah that's a very complicated task and I think for the next 10 years it will not get easier because EU will transfer quicker to electric cars where all these diesel cars will be transferred to countries like Ukraine. Thank you. Maxime. So uh, talking about promising uh, industries of or, uh, technologies I would like to touch two topics. Uh, through all the discussion, it was quite important uh, topic as financing, where we can get financing. So we should build partnership and should be part, build this partnership, not only uh, business uh, corporate level, but all the, on the country level. And I think that uh, today we have uh, uh, a lot of opportunities. And one of these is uh, hydrogen. Uh, you know that uh, Ukraine uh, is part of European hydrogen strategy and 240 uh, gigawatt initiatives which saying that uh, ukraine and north africa are the major non-eu partners in hydrogen development and i think that this is very important strategic signal and opportunity for us to develop this industry but and and germany is one of the major partners in development hydrogen in ukraine taking into account all our uh, all our positive factors in renewable development and and this industry but as you know uh, all projects all around the world producing hydrogen is not economically viable without state support and i hope that that our government working with european union with germany can develop this uh, the way of financial support to uh, corporates in ukraine to make this, uh, uh, to make the technology work. The other technology, which is also interesting for us to think about, is small mod modular reactors. I have just recently had serious meetings in, in the United States, and the United States can become our partner in developing this this technology as a next step for nuclear development in our country. I think that nuclear nuclear technology should be part of discussion during this this venue because it's quite contradiction contradictional approach to future of nuclear as part of green transition and i think that's another example where the industry can be promising and ukraine can be in having more than 55 percent of uh, uh nuclear in our generation mix 
can bring new life, developing small modular reactors as part of our transition. Thank you very much. Any, do you want to? In my, in my opinion, many, many uh, national industries have a lot of challenges for green transition, specific challenges, yes? And also we have to understand then that green transition for Ukraine especially, it's very important because just to, just to figure, for last 30 years of energy of uh, independence, yeah, we spent from, from state for import, for example, uh, natural gas, more than $100 billion. For the second, second one is for 30 years, uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian independence, we spent more than uh, $400,000 for import, all import, total import energy resources to, 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 to Ukraine. It's almost three gross domestic products, which we have today. It's a lot of spend for, for, for any country. And one way and one, one uh, strategic result, it's green transformation. It's, it's my opinion. Thank you very much. Um, we are coming towards the end of time. So I'm going to give each one of the speakers. Is it a quick question? <laughs> All right, this will be the last question. And just a, a warning, I'll give each of the speakers a minute or probably 30 seconds after this question to uh, sum up. So if you've got a particular person in mind, please say. My name is Natalia Kaczkowska. I am the MP of Ukraine, and I also the founder of the Ukrainian Foundation of Sustainable Development. I want to thank you so much for this incredible discussion within the framework of COP. That's very useful. My question is for the representative of the government, uh, because we had the discussion here uh, concerning the decarbonization of various sectors of the economy, but there was no communication of the financial system and the banks. At the moment, IFIs, the banks, the hedge funds are all declaring about a certain strategy on decarbonization, which means that they are reducing in their portfolios the companies, number of companies which are investing into fossil fuels or the industry but are not viable. Are any of these banks working with the, uh, are you working the government with the Ukrainian banks in this field? Are you setting the targets, obligatory or not obligatory targets concerning decarbonization? Because that is a direct influence to uh, indeed the development of Ukraine. Thank you very much. It's a huge subject. Um, so indeed the finance issue is extremely important. And uh, with implementation of NDC already, we started to work on financial strategy, how we implement it. And uh, this work is now being conducted to put all the necessary elements of such a strategy. It has to be reform of the budgeting system. So we have certain green tagging and understanding how the budget planning on the national and local level includes needs for green transition. It has to be with strategy, how we work with international financial institutions, with international mechanisms like Article 6 and the Paris Agreement and all other opportunities. It has to be work done in introduction of Ukraine, certain Ukrainian green taxonomy and uh, opportunities for green bonds. And of course, engagement of state banks and private companies to develop and use this mechanism. The mechanisms there are huge and a lot of them. There are a lot of private funds which are seeking for projects on green transition. So the task of the government is to have the specific work plan, how we're going to deliver it for Ukraine. Of course, it all goes in line with overall climate, not climate, investment climate in Ukraine and all the protection of investors. So if you want them to come to Ukraine, we also have to ensure that it's safe and they are protected and it's uh, possible to, to deliver projects in Ukraine. So 
it's up to deliver and we invite everybody to be part of this governmental task in Ukraine to engage, to provide comments, to have the really right strategy to make it happen. Thank you very much. And now we've only got two minutes left. So 30 seconds per person for any closing comment or remark. So Irina, if you want to say anything. Yeah, uh, I think that green transition and European integration are really issues that can boost Ukrainian economy if you find the, all the compromises and if we really uh, implement the necessary reforms of course with cooperation on finance and seeking all the opportunities i don't see any other way for ukrainian economy to develop rather than through the green transition agenda thank you very much Dimitro. Uh, well <clears throat> green transition is our future so business is ready to support this government in this decarbonization way thank you maxi just stress it again today we have unique opportunity uh, to become among leaders of decarbonization as a power industry, as a country. And I hope that we will not miss this opportunity. Thank you very much. In my opinion, we need to move very fast, supporting each other, because we have not many times. Anthony, final word. Yes, I shouldn't really have the final word, but maybe just uh, adaptation. I mean, it, the World Meteorological Organization published its State of the World report today. Uh, seven of the, world, the, the warmest years on record have been in the last seven years. And we're now looking forward to, or looking at potentially much larger rises in emissions. So we will have to adapt as well as mitigate. So I would su suggest that that is one of the areas that we all need to be looking at. Right, well, final closing remarks for me. Thanks very much to our speakers in the first panel and uh, our speakers today. Thanks very much to the audience. Thanks very much to the people who have helped put this together, uh, uh, DTEC and uh, UBTA and the embassy, as well as uh, partners behind the scenes. Thanks very much to the AV team for coping with an evolving IT infrastructure minute by minute as we went through the early part of the morning. Thanks to the online audience. Sorry for not being able to ask all of the questions that were submitted. And thanks indeed to everybody and good luck with COP. And let's hope there is significant ambition found and that we don't end up in the situation that some are forecasting. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.